Now, this is different from our typical must-do, must-see Disney World video. Whatever you do, do not do the following things on your Disney World vacation. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Disney World's crammed with a lot of must-do experiences, but there are also a lot of things you must not do if you want to pull off a successful trip. Don't worry, this isn't a laundry list of rules or anything. More so, I'll be talking about the things you're not going to want to miss out on, the things that'll weigh you down if you're not careful, and the things that you could potentially put way too much trust into that could be completely wrong and throw off your game plan. But let's start with that first thing, things you're not going to miss out on, because if you miss out on this, you may miss out on it for good. No second chances allowed. And that's waiting to buy exclusive merchandise. So there's a lot of Disney World demand going on lately. Demand for your spot in the parks, demand for reservations, demand for products. This demand concept is going to weave itself through other points in this video, so keep it in your back pocket. This excessive demand leads to certain limited edition and exclusive merchandise flying off the shelves seconds after it's stocked, even if said products are limited. So let's say you stumbled across a pair of exclusive mini ears that you know are a hot ticket item right now. There are two ways to approach this. Number one, grab it, grab it now. Do not, I repeat, do not wait and get them later if there's something you really, really, really want to own. Some merchandise you know you can wait on because it's more than likely going to be sold at multiple gift shops across property, like that Mickey Mouse Nuimo, for instance, or that one starter pack of Disney pins that you'll see 10 of in any particular location. But some merchandise isn't going to stick around, and you might not see it pop up at a later time. So if you know you want it, and you've got the feeling you're not going to see it again later because it's got one of those limited quantity signs next to it telling you you can only buy one or two of them then get it before it's snatched up for good now number two you could leave it huh wasn't the whole point of this section to prevent you from missing out on limited edition items why on earth would i tell you not to buy an exclusive souvenir well because you don't need to buy every limited edition item out there yep i said what i said as fun as it is to buy an exclusive piece of merchandise if your sole purpose in purchasing it is just to own it then you need to decide if the sudden splurge is going to be worth that extra dent in your budget Here's a little example from Bria here on our team. She says, I'm an avid pin collector. My main collections are Stitch and Tangled, but she's wound up spending $20 plus on a Daisy Duck pin before just because it was labeled as limited edition 700. That's how Disney gets you, making you think that it's something you have to have because there aren't many of them. And she's like, I like Daisy Duck, but she doesn't really have a place in my collection. And after she purchased it, she kept thinking about how she could have used that 20 bucks for something else, even multiple pins that better fit her pin board aesthetic. So basically what we're trying to say is avoid being wishy-washy. You've either got to go all in and buy those limited edition pieces when you see them, or don't worry about them and let another collector have their chance at purchasing it instead. I just don't want you to come down with a case of buyer's regret or non-buyer's regret if you miss your window of opportunity. So grab the limited edition item when you see it if you really need it, carry it around for a bit, mull it over, then decide what you want to do after that initial excitement subsides. If you just buy everything immediately, you're going to end up like me after Galaxy's Edge opened with like 15 Porg puppets. Nobody needs that. Okay, you're going to be thrown off a bit by this next point, but trust me, it's for the best. Booking table service meals for all your Disney dining. This is not something you want to do in Disney World, really ever. Is it hypocritical for the Disney food blog to tell you to go easy on all the table service reservations? I can see why you'd initially think that, but hear me out. Oftentimes, you're going to hear me giving you not-so-gentle reminders to start making your advanced dining reservations 60 days before the start of your Disney World vacation, and that's still very solid advice. You should do that, but you're not going to want to go overboard on these. Table service or sit-down dining, those character meals, you know, the character dining where you interact with characters while you're eating, and signature restaurants, those fancy ones, are great in moderation, but you're not going to want to book them for every meal of your trip. Here's why. One, expensive. It's okay to just choose one or two sit-down meals for your whole trip and fill the rest with that awesome quick service to save yourself some money. Believe it or not, there are really, really good fast food options throughout property that you're not going to want to skip out on. It's not all just burgers and puffy pizza. I promise we've got a whole video with all of the best fast food. And two, they're time-consuming meals. Each of those sit-down restaurants is going to take time out of your park day because they're not just places to eat, they're experiences. 
Fast food can get you filled up fast, or you can always pack some lunchy munchy things in your park bag to eat on the go, which will save both time and money. In the past, we've brought things like sandwiches and Ziploc baggies, prepackaged crackers and cookies, trail mix, those pouched apple sauces, and beef jerky for a little extra protein. Now, the third reason why you don't want to stock up on table service meals, they are very filling. So if you have a character breakfast at, say, Chef Mickey's at Disney's Contemporary Resort around 8 a.m., you're going to have a lot of all-you-can-eat food you'll want to fill up on to get your money's worth. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to turn around and just a few hours later eat another big prefix meal at like Be Our Guest Restaurant in Magic Kingdom. So pace yourself and study up on these table service menus ahead of time to see what's going to come with that price you're paying. Because if you're eating an all-you-can-eat location for breakfast, you're more than likely not going to want to eat at a restaurant that'll force you to order an appetizer, entree, and dessert for a set price for lunch. I've eaten in Disney World a lot, and I can tell you that portions are large and prices are high. So if you're going to have a nice big filling breakfast, you're probably not going to want to eat too much again until definitely dinner time. So a good rule of thumb is one sit down meal a day. That way you can kind of get out of the parks and relax a little bit in the middle of the day. Maybe do it for breakfast because those are always going to be the less expensive meals at those table service restaurants. So those are some good tips. Okay, this next tip is not something we usually talk about here on DFB Guide, but it is really, really important. Don't want to make traveling any harder than it already is? Then don't purchase a liquid souvenir unless you have a game plan for it. So those perfumes sold around Epcot's World Showcase, they smell really good. The soap dispensers that have those cute Mickey Mouse headphone patterns and the bubble wands, those are all fun. But traveling with liquid souvenirs can be a major pain. So if you're traveling via plane, many airlines do have strict rules when it comes to how many liquid ounces you're allowed to bring with you. According to the TSA website, you're allowed to bring a quartz size bag of liquids in your carry-on bag through the checkpoint. And these are limited to travel size containers that are 3.4 ounces or less per item. So anything bigger will have to go into a checked bag. Speaking as someone who has had her Mickey Mouse soap dispenser taken away from her at the TSA checkpoint and has been very, very sad on the way home, please don't do what I did. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes. Why did I pack my soap in my carry-on bag? Because I was throwing everything into my checked bag and I didn't have room and I'm like, I'll just take this soap in my carry-on bag, not even thinking, I was running late. And alas, some great TSA agent now has Mickey Mouse soap because I couldn't bring it through the checkpoint. So if you're someone who's only traveling with a carry-on and personal item, you'll have to dispose of any 3.5 ounce or bigger liquid bottles during that security screening, which is a major bummer if you purchased yourself a rather fancy perfume. So check on the liquid ounces of those containers before you purchase, because in the case of, say, a Mickey soap dispenser, you might be better off purchasing that on the Shop Disney website once you get back home. Even if you're driving, liquid souvenirs have the potential of getting kind of leaky. For items like bubble wands, make sure you've got a container to put the bubble juice in, then seal it shut. One should come with your bubble wand purchase, but just in case, you can always have an empty one on hand packed away in your suitcase. Even if your bubble wand is drained and suitcase ready, you might want to put it in a plastic bag to keep any excess liquid from leaking on your clothes. In fact, that's a good rule of thumb for any liquids. Pack them in separate bags and seal them shut with a rubber band or hair tie just in case. And if you know you're going to buy bottles of wine, maybe invest in one of those little wine bottle transport bags that like zip up all nice and tight. All in all, just think through that liquid purchase before you buy it and make sure it's not gonna be an extra pain or expense for you to get it back home. I don't want you to be sad like I was. Now, since we're already talking about losing money, which is never ever fun, let's talk about a few sneaky ways you may wind up paying more for something than you really need to. I don't want you to overpay for food in Disney World right now. Not all Disney World prices are created equal, not even for the exact same meals and snacks that you could find someplace else. Something you really don't want to do while you're in Disney World is be swindled out of those extra bucks. So here are some of the foods you should avoid ordering at select restaurants versus where you should order them instead. So here we go. Take notes. This is really good stuff. One, avoid ordering the fish and chips from the Rose and Crown Dining Room in Epcot. That's going to be 26 bucks. Order them from the pub area or the Yorkshire County Fish Shop. That's going to be 13 bucks, so half the price just because you're not getting table service. 
Number two, avoid ordering Tonga toast from Kona Cafe at Disney's Polynesian Village Resort. You're going to pay 17 bucks for that plated meal. Instead, order it at Captain Cook's. The price down there is $10.49. It's the exact same thing. The main difference between the two is the addition of that strawberry compote from the Kona Cafe version. So if you're cool with living without that, it's the exact same thing at Captain Cook's minus the red stuff. Number three, ordering that side of lobster mac and cheese from STK and Disney Springs, that's going to cost you $31. Instead, order the lobster mac and cheese from Nomad Lounge when it's available at Disney's Animal Kingdom. It's $24 bucks and it's unbelievable. Number four, avoid purchasing prepackaged Uncrustables from any Disney grab and go locations. You're gonna pay $3.99 per sandwich. Buy them and pack them ahead of time from your local grocery store or have them Instacarted to your hotel room. That's gonna be $4.18 for four of them. And of course, this goes for bottles of water and soda pop too. That's gonna cost you like five bucks in a Disney park. You can get it Instacarted to your room or pick some up on your way in and you're gonna save a ton of money. Now, admittedly, if this is your first time going to Disney World or you're not just a stickler about those menu prices like we are, it takes a lot of effort to track down these comparisons. And for the most part, snack prices will be pretty consistent across the board. But we always like to give you a heads up when and if we come across any significant discrepancies like this. So if you're nervous about overpaying for any item in particular, don't be. Just stick with us. On our YouTube page, website, and social media, we'll do all that research for you and then some. Okay, let's get back to things in Disney World that you're so not going to want to miss out on. Food edition. You don't want to miss out on the best snacks ever when you're in Disney World right now. You may already be familiar with the most popular Disney World snacks of all, like Dole Whip, Mickey Premium Bars, Mickey Shea Pretzels. But in your pursuit of the familiar, are you missing out on something that you may like 10 times more? Here are some all-time DFB favorite snacks that you don't want to overlook. First up, corn. No, we're not gonna sing the TikTok song, I promise. Harambe Fruit Market in Disney's Animal Kingdom is easy to pass by, but if you do make a pit stop here, they've got some great grilled corn on the cob with flavorful African spices. Totally not something you'd expect in a theme park, but delicious. Next is the peanut butter cookie pie at Main Street Confectionery in Magic Kingdom. This is an excellent sweet treat. It's huge. It hits the peanut butter sweet spot. It's a soft, rich cookie with peanut butter chips baked directly into the cookie for a nice added texture and some peanut butter M&Ms on top and chocolate frosting. What else could you want? Keeping in Magic Kingdom, if you make your way toward Adventureland, we sure do love grabbing a savory snack from the spring roll cart. The spring rolls have rotating flavors, but last time we visited, there were cheeseburger, buffalo chicken, 50th anniversary special pastrami and pepper jack cheese. So you never know what you're going to get, but usually they'll have cheeseburger. And one more because I love talking about caramel kusha in Epcot because then you guys get to tell me how I say it wrong, which I'm sure I do. And I apologize to all my German viewers out there. There are a lot of sweet options here, but the caramel flight is particularly noteworthy because A, you get four of them. B, they're infused with four different types of booze, pear, liqueur, bourbon, amaretto, and Irish cream. And C, they're $6.70 cents. What? That is not too bad for an alcohol infused treat. So there are hundreds of snacks out there, friends. And if you want to go from being a Disney World snack grasshopper to the snack master, you can always check out our super detailed DFB snack guides for all four parks. We literally have every single snack listed in those guides. We've got pictures, we've got reviews, we've got pricing, we've got everything. You can order those from dfbstore.com. And whether you just want one in particular or you wanna cover your bases with all of them, you can use code YouTube to save some money on your overall purchase before checking out. They're super, super, super useful. And we don't forget anything in there. Now, you know what you're really gonna to wanna to avoid? Anything that's a major time suck, like this next thing. You do not want to wait over an hour to see fireworks in Disney World right now. All right, I get it. The nighttime spectaculars at the Disney World parks are kind of a big deal, but they can still be a big part of your Disney day without wasting your Disney day. Truth be told, it doesn't matter how early you stake out your spot for the fireworks. Waiting two hours for them will give you just as good a view as waiting 30 minutes. But don't show up to see the Magic Kingdom fireworks at the very last second, because you might not be able to find a good place to squeeze into without kind of being a jerk. Instead, you'll be caught up in the wave of folks who were just as desperately trying to find a place to stand without being told to move it right along by a cast member. So 15 to 30 minutes should give you a reasonable amount of time to find a good spot without feeling rushed. 
What are the good spots? Well, in Epcot, the current show Harmonious plays out in the middle of World Showcase Lagoon. You're gonna catch the best angles of it from the front side of the World Showcase, AKA the area where you'll make the ultimate decision to start in Mexico or Canada. If you're looking for a space with minimal obstructions to your view, the walkway between Norway and Mexico gives you a lot of area to spread out and see the show. But in general, there are a lot of places around the World Showcase Lagoon to catch a nice shot of the Harmonious barges. Some areas just just might give you a slightly more skewed view than others of those water projections. As far as Magic Kingdom is concerned, you're going to need to be on Main Street USA or in the main hub area in front of the castle to get the full projection fireworks show of Disney Enchantment. If you can snag a spot close to the partner statue, you should have a pretty clear view, though you won't be able to see the projections stretching down Main Street USA as well. You'll also probably be squished up against everybody else. But then again, unless you're not planning on watching the castle projections, you're probably going to be squished up against everyone else anyway. Those are the breaks. The elevated sidewalks in the hub are also great spots to hunt down, since they'll give you a little leverage above other guests. Not a lot, but just enough. If you want to try to get a spot more toward Main Street USA, stick near Casey corner or the plaza ice cream parlor. Sure, you won't be in Main Street USA, but you'll still be able to look back and see the projections from there, and you'll be close enough to the castle to see those. Hold up, I'm not done with the fireworks talk just yet. Our next point is that you don't want to rely on all restaurants with fireworks viewing. There are some solid reasons to go to a table service restaurant like Ohana at Disney's Polynesian Village Resort or La Hacienda de San Angel in Epcot's Mexico Pavilion. You got good food, good atmosphere, and glorious air conditioning. But what you don't come to these places for is strictly based on your chance to see the park's fireworks. Ohana has a wall facing the Magic Kingdom with windows lined all the way across it. And if you're seated next to that area, then yes, you'll have a nice view of the Magic Kingdom fireworks. The restaurant will even pipe in the soundtrack and dim the lighting to enhance your experience but you are not guaranteed a seat near one of those windows. In fact, you might be seated at a table away from those windows facing a normal old wall. Even if you let the host up front know that you'd prefer to wait for a table with fireworks viewing, there's a possibility they won't be able to do that for you when you arrive. Same thing goes for La Hacienda. Though the Disney World website mentions that there are tall windows in the restaurant that overlook the lagoon and give you prime views of Harmonious, you're not always guaranteed a seat by those windows. Even if you get a reservation around the time the show is about to happen, there's a good possibility that guests who are already seated by the windows are going to stay put for the show, even if they've already finished their meal. Not to mention the fireworks viewings for Harmonious aren't exactly prime, as mentioned on the website. Remember what I said earlier about Harmonious being best viewed straight on, since what's playing out on the barges makes up a huge part of the storytelling here? You're not going to get that with the La Hacienda view, so window seat or not, you could wind up missing a lot of the main show elements if you choose to watch Harmonious from that point of view. So which restaurants will actually guarantee you a nice view of the shows? The signature restaurant California Grill at Disney's Contemporary Resort sits on the 15th floor of the hotel, making it a great spot to catch those Magic Kingdom fireworks. Whether you're sitting next to a window or not doesn't really matter since California Grill has a private outdoor balcony that you can step onto when the show's about to start. Topolino's Terrace, another signature restaurant at Disney's Riviera Resort, has a similar setup. It also sits on top of the resort and has a lovely little outdoor terrace where you can see the harmonious fireworks out in the distance while also enjoying a drink or two. Mind you, neither of these restaurants is going to give you a pristine view of the projections and Topolino's Terrace is a little far away. You're not going to see everything going on on World Showcase Lagoon. So if you're really aiming for the show and the whole show, you may be better off making reservations for a dessert or dinner party. Magic Kingdom has three different dessert parties, a pre-party, an after-party, and a Disney Enchantment Treats and Seats party. The big differences between these three are when you want to be served those sugary goodies along with your alcohol alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverages, and whether or not you want to sit or stand during the show. If you choose the pre or after party, you'll stand in a reserved section of the plaza garden area. But if you choose the treats and seats, you'll be able to sit back and enjoy the show from the comfort of the Tomorrowland Terrace patio. Treats and seats cost $114 per adult, while the pre and after party is $99, bucks, so $15 for a seat. For Epcot, you can book a full-on dinner package at either Rose and Crown Dining Room in the UK Pavilion or Spice Road Table at the Morocco Pavilion. The Rose and Crown version will not only give you priority seating on their waterfront patio, but it'll 
also serve up a prefix menu where you'll be able to choose one appetizer, one entree, a dessert platter, and unlimited beverages for $89 per person. Over at Spice Road, you'll be seated at their covered outdoor dining area where you'll be able to munch on an assortment of Mediterranean small plates, desserts, and unlimited beverages there too for $72. Bucks. Which one's better? Well, depends. Spice Road table might be cheaper, but for an extra $17, bucks, you will get more food at Rose and Crown. It also depends on what style of food you prefer. If you want Mediterranean food, tapas, then Spice Road is for you, while those looking for a selection of comfort foods will have a better time noshing at Rose and Crown. I also think you're going to get a slightly better view at Spice Road. Whatever you choose, know that you've got options. So if you want to go to Ohana or La Hacienda de San Angel during your upcoming trip, go there for the food and let the fireworks viewing potential just be a nice little perk if it happens for you. Now, sometimes we put a little too much faith in those seemingly trustworthy Disney services. So here's how to avoid getting caught off guard with those. You don't wanna trust that Genie Plus won't change. Now this goes for all of Disney tech, all of Disney rides, how you get to actually ride those new rides. Listen, all that stuff is changing all the time. That is why we're here. That's why you're here watching these videos. That's why you're following our social media. That's why you're on our newsletter is because you know it's our job to pay attention to that stuff every single day and we're gonna keep you updated so that you don't have to watch it every single day. All right, so we've got a whole video that we just released not too long ago that goes in depth with how you can navigate that Disney Genie planning stuff and that's found on the My Disney Experience app. It's got a lot of information, like a lot. There's a lot going on in that video, but it's info we've had to keep track of ever since the Disney Genie tool launched last year because it does change all the time. So if it's two months before your big trip and you decide to check out Disney Genie and all its features, that's great. You definitely want to start looking at that stuff ahead of time, but don't make that the only time you look at that service before you head off because there's a good possibility Disney Genie is going to switch up and add more lightning lane options, take some rides off, or add a new rule to when and how you can book because they are really quote unquote optimizing that service all the time and that means change for you. I've been caught off guard in the parks when I didn't know a change was made and all of a sudden I can't do what I thought I could do and I don't know what's going on and you don't want to waste your park time figuring all that out, right? And by the way, if all of this sounds like mumbo jumbo to you and you're kind of panicking and like getting anxious about it, go ahead and watch that Disney Genie video. It's going to calm your nerves. It's going to give you all the information you need to know. So stay proactive and we promise we will too. This next point might make you feel a little bit antsy, but believe me, it's best you learn about it now and not before it's too late. At the moment, you don't want to plan around an unofficial attraction opening. Okay, pop quiz. How many official dates for rides and attractions were announced for Disney World during the D23 convention this year? Trick question. Zero. I'm not throwing Disney under the bus here. It is tricky to give set in stone dates for experiences when Disney and their Imagineering team still have a lot of work to finish up. And believe me, the last time they gave concrete dates for stuff, a pandemic happened. So they've learned their lesson. And we'd rather Disney take more time and give us a really good ride rather than do a rush job and make something that we're ultimately underwhelmed by. Which is why we still don't have many official release dates yet. Disney doesn't want anybody planning a trip specifically for an opening only to find out the project had to be delayed a little bit longer. So let's use Tron Light Cycle Run's unofficial timeline as an example of why you should not base your entire Disney World vacation around one ride opening. At the moment, we've got a vague spring 2023 release date for Tron. Now, this is a high-speed coaster that's going to open in Tomorrowland at Magic Kingdom, and people are super, super jazzed about it, right? I am too. But will it open in late spring? Early spring? What really is spring, anyway? No clue. All we got is spring. But if you want to make sure you actually get to experience this ride on your upcoming trip, then you may want to book your vacation for later in the summer or early fall to make sure the ride really is open during your visit and it's gone through its little process of working out the kinks and those super extra long lines when all us bloggers and influencers have to ride it 15 times so that we can, you know, POV it for you, right? Because if you try to aim for Tron's official opening date in the spring, whenever that's going to be, you might wind up scheduling your trip prematurely and missing it altogether. Yeah, you could wait to book your trip and instead listen for an official date to pop up so you can aim to be one of the first people to ride this cool looking techno ride. But Disney's usually pretty unpredictable when it comes to how soon they'll release an official date. So you could wind up hearing that this ride is finally going to open in exactly a month, 
But then if you plan your big trip with only a month to spare, you're going to miss that 60-day advance dining reservation window. You could definitely miss out on the hotel room you want. It's been really hard to book hotel rooms last minute in Disney World recently. And remember, those flight prices also hike up the closer and closer you get to your departure date. So in the end, when you plan to go to Disney World is going to depend on what works best for you and your travel group. But if you don't want to miss out on that big new ride and you don't plan on saving up for Disney again until a good long while has passed, then and plan for a later season so you actually have the chance to experience the ride. Okay, so this needs a part two because to actually get on the ride once you're in Disney World could mean more than just going after its official opening date. We're gonna talk next about virtual queues. You do not wanna forget about these. Before I get back into more Tron chit chat, let's take a look at our current newest roller coaster in Disney World, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. You'll find Cosmic Rewind over in Epcot and that ride is a blast, literally figuratively all of the above. Does it make me nauseous? Does it make me want to barf sometimes? Yes. Do I love the soundtrack and the backwards launch and how Drax takes everything literally even on ride? Also, yes. Currently, there isn't a standby queue for Cosmic Rewind. There will be, but there isn't per the release of this video. Lately, Disney World's been using a virtual queue system in place of a standby line for their newest rides. And that helps prevent those five plus hour wait times like we saw happen when Slinky Dog Dash opened back in 2018. And remember when Frozen opened, oh my goodness. And Flight of Passage was wild. So now, if you're not familiar with how the virtual queues work, let's break it down. You can join a virtual queue on your My Disney Experience app you'll see it in the main group of options once you tap on the three horizontal lines at the bottom of the screen. Virtual queues open up twice daily, usually once at 7 a.m. and once at 1 p.m. If you join a virtual queue successfully, you'll get a boarding group number. When it's your boarding group's time to ride, you'll receive a notification saying to head on over. Not too intimidating, right? Well, it can be. See, if you miss your times to book a virtual queue, it's game over. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. You can also buy an individual Lightning Lane entrance instead when 7 a.m. rolls around, which may be easier to obtain, but it's going to cost you 15 bucks plus per person per ride through, which can be quite the pricey endeavor for one ride on top of your theme park tickets, especially if you got a big group of people. Now that said, and I've said this in these videos before, if you really, 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 really want to ride a ride, go ahead and buy it. Just budget for it, y'all. Then you've got it locked in. You don't have to worry about the virtual queue. But Going back to our virtual queue talk, in many ways, the virtual queue line is really great and helps make sure wait times for new rides don't ruin your Disney day. So that's a plus, but it's also nerve wracking. When Cosmic Rewind first opened, boarding passes were snatched up within seconds, literal seconds after they released. And that can be frustrating if you only have one day in Epcot to experience everything and you don't plan on coming back to the parks anytime soon. So let's connect this back to Tron Light Cycle Run, though you probably already have a pretty good idea what we're gonna say. If history repeats itself, which it will, Tron will more than likely become the newest ride to use a boarding group or virtual queue system. So if you're planning on riding this new coaster during your 2023 trip, don't forget that it's probably not gonna have a standby queue for you to jump into whenever you feel like it. Study up on the best tips for getting a boarding group a virtual queue spot now so that you'll be prepared later on. We've got a page on the site covering our favorite methods for securing those virtual queues. I will link that in the description below. But here's a quick sample of some of the things you'll learn. Number one, speed is key. So plan on confirming your ride party in advance. You can do this up to an hour before you try to score a space in a boarding group. Starting at 6 a.m., you can tap into the virtual queue and set up your party so that you have fewer hoops to jump through when boarding groups become available at 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. On the app, under Join Virtual Queue, you'll find a button that says Confirm Your Party. Then when the time comes, all you have to do is join, 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 instead of worrying about an extra step that'll slow you down. Number two, you have to physically be in the park to grab that boarding pass when 1 p.m. rolls around. You can get that 7 a.m. boarding pass from anywhere you are, even the comfort of your hotel bed. But 1 p.m., gotta be in the park. Number three, if you start your day in, say, Hollywood Studios, and you plan on hopping over to Magic Kingdom to ride Tron for your second park of the day, it's not gonna happen. Since park hopping doesn't start until after 2 p.m., and the virtual queues drop at 7 a.m. and 1 p.m., you won't be able to grab your boarding pass without a park pass reservation for that park that day, meaning you need to prioritize Magic Kingdom as the first park of your day. And you gotta get that park pass for that park that that ride is in as far in advance as you can. Okay, reservations are a pretty big part of how you plan your Disney World vacation these days, and we're not just talking about dining reservations. Missing a boarding pass can certainly be a bummer and a half, but there are some reservations that are even worse to miss out on. So our next, you don't wanna do this in Disney World right now, 
is not making park pass reservations. Long gone are those days of impromptu Disney World trips, at least if you want to go to a certain park. Now, Disney requires a lot of pre-planning to make sure your trip goes as smoothly as possible. Some of this pre-planning is stuff we've had around for lots of years, like booking your hotel room ahead of time or grabbing advanced dining reservations for those restaurants. But in 2020, we were introduced to that new reservation, the Park Pass Reservation. Hold on, folks. Even if you're super duper familiar with how this process works, their rules have changed recently on how these reservations work. So hang tight to learn more about those. Park Pass Reservations are the equivalent of seat saving on the school bus. You'll guarantee your spot in the park for the day. Even if you purchase a park ticket, you cannot, I repeat, cannot skip out on the Park Pass Reservation step. Both a ticket and a reservation are required to get into the park. And by the looks of it, that's going to be the norm for a very long time. Park Pass reservations don't have to be stressful, though. After you purchase your ticket, Disney's going to prompt you with a little reminder to immediately save your spot in the park so they know when and where to expect you on each day. But before you make your ticket purchase, please check the Disney World availability calendar beforehand to make sure the day you're wanting to visit a particular park isn't already booked up. You'll be able to find this calendar before you check out. Disney has it posted on the top of the ticket page with a little warning that also includes encourages you to check the calendar before jumping the gun with the purchases. Now note that guests with a hotel reservation, guests with annual passes, and guests with just regular tickets and no hotel reservation have different availability calendars. That gets a little confusing, but usually the guests with hotel reservations and park tickets have a little more availability in the park than annual pass holders and guests that just have tickets. So if you do have a hotel, I would say go look at that availability calendar and book your park passes through your hotel reservation. Okay, now for the new rules I promised. At the end of August this year, the Park Pass reservations switched things up a little bit. New rule number one, you can now book a Park Pass reservation for more than one ticket type at a time, meaning you can book Park Pass reservations for both single day tickets and annual passes together, just in case someone in your party doesn't have an annual pass or just in case you're joining a party where everyone else has annual passes except you. Remember that if you're trying to book park passes for more than one ticket type together, there must be pass availability on both calendars. So if you're booking for an annual pass holder and a single day ticket guest, there must be availability on both the annual pass calendar and the regular theme park tickets calendar. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Rule number two, you can now modify both your date and your park for your park pass reservation without canceling it first. This is great because before it could be nerve wracking to completely cancel a reservation you desperately needed to change and risk losing your spot in the parks for good. Now, there are limitations to this new rule, more so when it comes to the way annual pass holders choose to book their reservations. We've got a little blog post on that that we're linking here. So if you want to read more about the exceptions, I'll link our post that goes a little more in depth with it all down in the description. It's also important to note that if you want to modify a park pass reservation with your group, you'll need to adjust the settings on the My Disney Experience app to allow family members and friends to see all my plans instead of just only plans we share if you want to be able to book or modify park pass reservations together. You can do this by going to the My Profile section of your My Disney Experience app and tapping the friends and family list from there. You'll select the friend you want to share plans with and choose all my plans. I know, that's a lot of info, but in general, park passes are pretty straightforward to make and the Disney World website will walk you through the steps to make sure you feel confident about the process. They'll even send you an email confirmation so you have a receipt trail for an extra dose of peace of mind. By the way, stick a little star next to those emails because if something does happen in Disney World, you always want that receipt. Get a screenshot, get something that you can show guest services if there's a snag or a glitch. Okay, next on our list, are you ready for a heart to heart? All right, let's get this out in the open stat. This is your vacation. It is not your neighbor's vacation who's been to Disney World five times already this year. It's not your coworker's vacation who used to be a cast member and knows all the insider secrets. It's not my vacation. It's yours. So plan for your preferences and what you want to do. You do not want to rely on someone else's experience to figure out your must-dos. Can they inform 
yes, but just because someone says you have to do X, Y, or Z doesn't mean that that's going to be what you want to do, and it doesn't have to be. Quick hypothetical scenario for you. Let's say you're going to Epcot for the first time in forever. Everyone's raving about how cool Space 220 is and that you just have to go to experience this restaurant amongst the stars and astronauts. And so you get up at 5.45 a.m. 60 days before your big trip to make those advanced dining reservations and you get them. But it's looking like the dinner time slot you booked is going to be pretty expensive, like $79 per person expensive. But you know, everyone you've talked to has absolutely loved this place and has told you it's worth it. So you stick with the reservation and you dine there when it comes time. But even though the Space 220 atmosphere is cool, you and your group might come to realize that the meal itself is just a little too blah and the experience took a major chunk out of other things you could have been doing around the park instead. But the flip opposite could also happen. You could hear down the grapevine that people say Space 220 is overrated, so you decide to skip out on getting an ADR for it, only to regret it because honestly you know how much your kids would love dining at Space 220. It's just too bad all the reservations are already booked solid. I could keep going with scenario after scenario, but at the end of the day, you know what you want to do the most. I might not be the world's biggest fan of Coral Reef and Epcot, but you might know that your little ones love all things under the sea and will go gaga for a restaurant surrounded by large aquariums with big giant sea turtles, right? And I might sing the praises of a certain Epcot festival food, but you know it's got ingredients in there you're not going to vibe with. I don't know why I keep using Epcot as an example. This just got a lot of options, but this is true for every part. The reason that the DFB team and I do the reviews we do on YouTube and the website and those extensive DFB dining guides over on our store isn't so you can just blindly follow what we like and don't like. It's to show you what type of people are going to like certain foods and restaurants and what type of people may be better off tracking down other places to eat that they're going to vibe with 10 times more. Whenever we're training new reporters or writers here at DFB, we always tell them don't say something's good or bad. It's not up to us to say it's good or bad. It's up to us to really show what the experience is like, to show what the food looks like to let you know what the textures are, the flavors are, to let you know what the ride feels like, and to give a close a comparison as possible to something you might have experienced so that you can make a good decision for you. For us to say something's good or bad, what does that mean to you? Nothing. What you want to know is what it's actually like, what the experience is, so you can figure out if it makes sense for you. So while you're busy studying up on the different menus and reviews on our pages and books, make sure you keep an open mind and discuss your different options out loud with your family. That way you can all feel satisfied with the selections filling up your dining itineraries and you're not hinging it on what someone in your Facebook group said or what your kid's friend's mom did or Aunt Susan. Like Aunt Susan doesn't know what she's talking about in Disney World. So you gotta do your own research and you gotta figure out what's gonna suit your family. All right, one last thing you don't want to do, don't stress about it. If there are any planning struggles you're coming across while you're trying to figure out all the odds and ends of your Disney World vacation, stick around here with the DFB YouTube channel, our website, our social media platforms. It's our job to clear things up for you, to answer your questions, to make sure that you're not stressed about your vacation and that you have the best possible vacation for you. That's why we get up in the morning. That's why we do what we do. So thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.